This is the audio commentary for Act 2 of All My Sons. And again, the act has been divided into different sections. There are four sections to Act 2. And what you need to do is read each section. And again, highlight, underline, or note anything you think is important or interesting. Then restart the video when you've finished reading and annotate your text as I talk you through the annotations on this PDF. So the first section of the play begins obviously at the start of Act 2 and goes down to the very top of page 10 of the document here, um, really when um, Joe says, a father is a father. Um, and you're going to stop there in your reading. So what I want you to do is read pages 1 to 10, or in your copies of the play, it should be page 41 to 50. That should take you between 10 and 15 minutes just to read it. Remember, you're not doing a lot of um, thinking about it. Just read it. Think about how you react to it if you want to as you go through it, but don't overthink your analysis of it. We'll go through that together um, when we go through the annotations. So you can pause the video now and um, start working through that section. So the first thing that I think is important to note here is that the Act 2 begins on the same day. Um, what you have in All My Sons is a very um, tight time frame. Um, what Arthur Miller is doing actually is drawing on the traditions of tragedy, um, which is of, have their origins in Greek theatre, and they're often very compressed time frames. So it obviously adds to intensifying the, the action and the drama here. And so scene two opens um, with this um, conversation between Kate um, and Chris here. And she says, um, mother says, um, he's worried. She's talking about um, Joe here. We're dumb, Chris. Dad and I are stupid people. We don't know anything. You've got to protect us. To his last day in court, Steve never gave up the idea that dad made him do it. So again, reinforcing at the beginning of act two that um, that Steve, Anne and George's father never um, has always pleaded his innocence and protested his innocence here. But we see from mother's anxiety or Kate's anxiety in this opening of act two that um, perhaps there's a reason for um, her anxiety over the fact that he's been protesting his innocence all this time. And um, because obviously act two, we're waiting for George to arrive. We know that Anne's brother George is coming to visit the Keller household. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety from the characters about why that might be. Um, so just a little bit further down this page, I've just noted this quote as well, um, when Mother says, you don't realise how people can hate Chris. They can hate so much they'll tear the world to pieces. And it's that idea about how people, um, the neighbourhood and community have judged Steve um, for his crimes here. Um, remember in Act 1 we had that um, speech from Joe where he talked about holding his head high in front of the community. It's important there. If you keep going down now onto page 3, Anne says here, um, people like to do things for the Kellers. Been that way since I can remember when she's talking to the neighbours here. And again, it's reinforcing the position of the Kellers within the community. Remember that Anne's family, very much shunned by the community to the extent that they've moved away from the area. And Anne said earlier there was no way she could have stayed living in this particular area. And again, it's, it's, it's emphasising that people do respect Joe and his family here at the beginning of Act 2. Down here towards the bottom, Anne says, I've always thought of Chris. When he tells you something, you know it's so. He relaxes me. You know, sharing her feelings with um, Sue here about the love that she shares for Chris. And Sue says here, um, they're talking about money. And Sue reminds Anne that money is important. It makes all the difference. And maybe Anne has got something of a naive attitude when she says it wouldn't matter to me. Um, you know, you think about the importance of a comfortable life um, here post-World War II. Um, a time of hardship really in America um, and Sue says it does make all the difference um, and she's suggesting that it is important that idea of sort of personal wealth or um, or being comfortable in particular it's not necessarily about being rich it's about being comfortable um, in your family and I think that is important it's a value that Joe shares here um, and she says here when you take up housekeeping try to find a place away from here so she, what she suggests here is that her husband is unhappy with Chris around. Um, and that Chris, as she says down here, Chris makes people want to be better than it's possible to be, she says here. This idea that Chris is a good person, but that in contrast, um, Sue and 
Jim are struggling somewhat in, in the idea of, in the shadow of Chris's goodness that he has here in the play. Um, and that's important. Keep going down now onto page five. Sue says, I resent living next door to the Holy Family, that idea that this family are the image of um, respectability, um, of comfort, financial security, genuine love that we've seen between Joe and um, his kids and, and the kids' love for their parents as well here, um, that there's this sense of, of resentment from Sue. And then she says here, which is important, everybody knows Joe pulled a fast one to get out of jail, that those suspicions of the neighbourhood about Joe's role in creating or shipping out those cracked cylinder heads um, exist still within the neighbourhood. Um, and they give him credit for being smart, says here, um, you know, get it, for getting away with it. She's telling Anne. And of course, that would be very infuriating to Anne because it's her father who's in prison, really, for, the, for these crimes. So it's quite um, an interesting exchange here between Anne and Sue. And then um, what happens here um, in this next scene, we've got this exchange with Chris arriving here. Um, and Anne tells Chris that Sue has told her that people think Joe is guilty. Um, and, you know, she, she says here, you said it was all forgotten. It's this idea about rumours persisting. If you think about it, it's an interesting connection here with Streetcar Named Desire in the fact that um, Blanche is troubled by the rumours about her past here and the gossip that com comes with it. Um, the community still worry about Joe, and this obviously really worries Anne here in this scene. Um, on the next scene, we get this exchange between Chris and Anne. Again, discussing really the relation, the impact that the criminal acts that Steve's been, um, been put in prison for, the impact that it's had on Anne's relationship with her father. When she says here, I turn my back on my father, she says here. And Chris says, do you think I could forgive him if he'd done that thing? So she's saying, you know, that, and, and Chris is asserting here that the man is innocent, that Joe is innocent. And it's a, just a lot of, um, really layering on the the or emphasizing the love that Chris has for his father um the impact that um that Steve's crimes have had on his relationship with his daughter here and the impact that this has had on the relationships between parents and children is important so if we keep going down a little further um again the Joe arrives here and there's another one of these quite um uh, jokey conversations you can see them all laughing here and I think this is really important and it's a clever dramatic device that Arthur Miller uses in act two particularly of all my sons because it's so full of tension this act when George arrives you're going to see that it's just so full of tension here but he breaks it up with these little moments of um, joviality and humor here and it what it does is it it really is playing with the audience's emotions um you know you're really up and down as you watch this happen here and they they have this sort of joking relationship and um keller says i'd like to brooch something with you uh, and it's brooch obviously not brooch something with you um keller went to night school there's this sort of idea that he's not the intellectual he's very much a working um, man a self-made man who's made himself comfortable and set up his family um, to be comfortable. And it's something he's very proud of here in the way that he defines himself. He says here on the top of page nine or page 49 in your document, my only accomplishment is my son. He has this absolute love for Chris. And um, again, all his success is not really about um, greed and it's not really about his own personal accomplishments. It's all about for Joe providing for his son here. Later down, he says, I'd like you and George, to, he says to Anne, I'd like you and George to go to him, that's Steve in prison, and tell him, Dad, Joe wants to bring you into the business when you get out. So, you know, we perhaps know having when we know what happens in the play that he's overcompensating somewhat here. And he says he wouldn't have him as a partner, but he'd set him up with a job um, in the play. And, uh, you know, he's trying to put right perhaps this, this idea. And he's, he's very upset that Anne has turned her back on, his fa on her father here. Um, and the, the way they talk about it, um, you know, Anne says, Joe, you owe him nothing, um, but but he's your father, Joe says here. Um, and, and Chris's encouragement for Anne to, he says, kick him in the teeth. I don't want him in the plant. Um, you understand. And besides, don't talk about him like that. People misunderstand you. Um, and, you know, this, what Joe's is insisting on is, as he says here, a father is a father. So no matter what happens, he is asserting here that 
the relationship between fathers and children should be maintained and sustained through this. So he's reinforcing this view. And it says, I just wrote there and he leaves the stage, but it's a little bit further down um, when he leaves the stage here. But after this exchange, um, he leaves the stage to go and shave. Um, he turns and with a smile on his face. He says, a father is a father. Um, and uh, the stage directions are important here. It's a commanding outburst in high nervousness. You know, he is, a, he is nervous about, um, his relationship with Chris, though, and it says, as though the outburst has revealed him, he looks about and um, wanting to retract him, his hand goes to his cheek. You know, this is the essence of Joe and what's so important to him, that his role as a father and providing for his family, providing a, a business for Chris to take over in the future is, is what motivates and, and draws Joe. So you're now going to read section two and as i indicated here it's about eight minutes worth of reading so a little bit less than um what you read last time so starts here with anne's line let's forget the whole thing joe so down and um, the rest of page 10 page 11 page 12 page 13 um, page 14 page 15 page 16 and then halfway well three quarters of the way down page 17 um, and here is when mother enters um, during this scene. So you need to read those sections, pause the video while you read it, and then come back and we'll go through that together um, on the video. Okay, so this section is obviously a very important part of Act Two as George brings the, the, the revelation that he believes that Joe was the one who is to blame for shipping out the cracked cylinder heads and not Steve and, and um, George's father here. So George's arrival is another catalytic moment in the play as he, he brings about a change or new information into the play here. So his arrival is really significant. And I think it's important that his arrival is preceded by um, this moment where Keller Joe sings um, here to Lydia and says, come on up and comb my Katie's hair or come on up because she's my lady fair. You know, there's a sort of image of of happiness really here between Joe and Kate and um, the neighbors being used there to create this image of it before Jim arrives with George. Um, and Jim immediately says, don't bring him in here. You know, really ramping up the drama here at George's arrival um, and entrance and the impact that it's going to have on the rest of the play. So as um, Jim arrives here, you can see um, he's sort of, as he comes into the, in, into the play, He's sort of full of anger, um, really het up and wound up here. So it says here, he's a paler man, but on the edge of his self-restraint, he speaks quietly, although afraid of himself, of, for find himself screaming. So this idea that he has got this truth that he needs to reveal here. Um, um, George, again, is not very friendly towards Chris here. Um, at the beginning of the play, he pulls away, coming towards Anne. Um, and he looks over at his former house. So obviously immediately being reminded of what they lost or left behind um, at the beginning when he arrives in, into the play here or on the scene here. Um, he note, what's noticing, what's, what is important to notice, I think, is that um, George's anger is very much directed towards Joe and not towards Kate. He says, good old Kate remembered my grape juice. He's got a real affection for Kate. I think that's important here um, when he talks about it. And Chris um, says, talks about the tree and says he had it, we had it here for Larry, you know, why afraid you'll forget him, you know, sort of a real curtness between the two of them there in the way that they're um, speaking to each other. I mean, bear in mind, these two young men probably grew up together and were friendly as, as, young, as, as um, children. Um, and obviously it's been three years since George has lived in the area. Um, but he and Chris obviously go a long way back, but there's clearly tension between them in the exchange um, as George arrives here. So later on, um, George talks about his visit to Steve and he describes Steve, his father, as he's a little man. You know, metaphorically, um, he's been reduced and diminished by the fact that he's gone to jail for this crime here. Um, and, um, and then George says quite bluntly um, that the reason Anne cannot marry Chris is because Chris's father destroyed your family. And he's going to explain now how he sees Joe as responsible for the destruction of his and Anne's family here. And what you notice if you look at the dialogue here is you've got very short lines of dialogue. So again, 
questions and answers, um, short dialogue, much like Oliana here, um, ramping up the tension, or even when um, Stanley is interrogating Blanche, you get the same sense of tension building up through the short lines of dialogue. Um, and George says here, since he's been to see Steve, um, my life has turned upside down since then. Um, he says to Anne that they can never be forgiven for, and what he means there is for deserting their father, for abandoning him, um, which is important. Um, and then at, at, on this page, um, you get the declaration here or the truth coming out from George that Joe told him on the phone, he told him to weld, cover up the cracks in any way he could and ship them out. So that's the cracked cylinder heads. And what George has discovered is that it's Joe who told Steve to do this. And, and Chris is absolutely flabbergasted and doesn't believe it at all um, in any way. Um, and George notices here that um, Joe wasn't able to go to the factory. He couldn't come down there because suddenly he gets the flu. Um, and that's quite important. So just take a note of that. That's the reason Joe couldn't go to have a look at the cracked cylinder heads and check them himself. But according to George, he promised Steve that he would take responsibility for it. And of course, doing it over the telephone means there's no tangible proof to hold up in court about this. And you can see from that tense exchange of dialogue earlier in the previous page, you go to these more uh, these monologues here from George as he spills out the truth. Um, and his anger here, and you can see it in the stage direction, surging up at Chris here, so angry. And obviously what it's doing is creating dramatic irony because Joe is not on the stage at this point. And so he doesn't know that all of this is being revealed between these two young, or the young characters here, um, and obviously to the audience. And George then says to Chris, you know in your heart, Joe did it. And again, it comes back to some of the things we were noticing in Act One about Kate and this idea in the play that characters know more than they're letting on, um, that they are that they they are enjoying their sort of ignorance, they're sort of reveling in their ignorance here. So, is there a question around here about um, Chris deluding himself about his father or choosing to ignore the truth about his father? George makes two comments here about Joe, you know, and um, he wasn't able to go down to the factory. And that's the same Joe Keller who never left his shop without first going around to see that all the lights were out. The same man who knows how many minutes a day his workers spend in the toilet. So, you know, he's such a sort of obsessive about work that he would allow these cylinder heads to be shipped off without checking them. And it doesn't really fit with the sort of attitude that Joe has to work. And what you notice here in the next page is that in the stage directions and being deeply shaken here, that she is starting to believe this at this point. Um, George tells her that everything they have, the Kellers have, is covered in blood. So that metaphor there for their guilt and their culpability. Um, and he says, he calls Chris, he says to Chris, and he knows, Annie, he knows. So this idea that um, he believes that Chris actually really does know the truth. And, and Chris refers to George as the voice of God, you know, come here in judgment here. And he even questions, George, George questions why Chris's name is not on the business. And we, we saw Joe, uh, Joe talk about that in the previous act. So this idea that, um, you know, perhaps that's another indication that Chris is aware of his father's um, guilt here and the crime that he committed. So this exchange um, carries on just down to the end here between Chris and um, George. Um, obviously a real moment of tension when George is, um, confront, has confronted Chris, but Chris is not yet willing to accept that this is the truth. So that takes you then to section three. And this section is a bit um, shorter than the other sections that we've just read here. Um, and obviously this is the moment where mother enters the stage. So we've heard the accusations that George has made about Joe and Chris's response to that. And then obviously this is going to build into this as Kate gets involved here. So when you're reading this next section, you're reading um, from here um, down onto page 18 of the document, page 19 of the document, page 20, page 21, and then just to halfway down page 22, um, which is Joe's re-entrance into the scene here at this point. So if you can read that section and again, just read, highlight, annotate, anything you think is significant, important or interesting, then when you're ready, unpause the video, go back to the start of section three and we will go through that together. 
So at the start of this section of Act Two, um, Arthur Miller reminds the audience of A, the affection between George and Kate. As it says here, um, George says he's always liked to hello Kate. It's a reminder that it's Joe that he's angry with, not Kate, at the beginning of this section. And then this sort of concern about the way um, that um, George has changed since he was last in the area. Mother says, I'm sick to look at you. What's the matter with your mother? Doesn't, why doesn't she feed you? Um, and it's a real um, emphasis of um, Kate's role as a mother here. You know, that sort of maternal fussing that she's doing at this point um, in the play is important. And she reminds down, reminds the, well, Mark Miller reminds the audience about that idea in the play that's so important about providing for your children. And she says how we worked and planned for you and you end up no better than us. You know, she really wants her children and the next generation to be better off than she was. Um, and again, it's just this really nice exchange between um, them here about this hunger. And it's quite, um, you know, it eases from the, from the tension of the previous section that we've just looked at when George is, is confronting Chris. And you've got this, I've, I've drawn this lovely diagram for you here, got this real up and down in terms of the tension for the audience, you know, making it much more dramatically intense to watch as we move between, um, you know, serious accusations and confrontations to jokes like um, the fact that Kate could turn Gandhi into a heavyweight um, based on, you know, her cooking and her ability to feed other people. Um, is important here. So a little bit further down, again, mother's trying to diffuse the situation. She says, Georgie will have no argument. Um, how could we have an argument, Georgie? And even the use of that affectionate term, Georgie, when she speaks to him, shows that close relationship between the two of them. Um, and then um, Lydia, again, is, is used here by Arthur Miller to remind the audience that a long time has passed since George was there and in that area. And, you know, three years is a very long time for George and Anne's father to be in prison here for a crime he didn't commit. Um, and then I love this bit down here when Lydia says to George, would you like to see my babies? Um, come on. And George says, I don't think so, Lydia. And I um, I, I identify with George there because I don't always want to see people's babies. Um, but I just, I just like that kind of reaction, um, you know, between the two of them, like he's not interested in the, in the kids at all here. Um, and then... Um, so George and, uh, and, and, you know, the idea here that um, mother says to George, I told you to marry that girl and stay out of the war. You know, he could have avoided um, the draft and having to go and fight in the Second World War if he had married Lydia um, a while ago. And he didn't, obviously. Um, so, again, another reminder about the past that's come, but also a reminder, I think, significantly that George is also somebody who served in the war. And that's important as well. So um, we keep going down here, um, and it, I think what happens at the end down here um, is this mention of Joe, when George says, Joe, Joe wants me here, um, and this idea that he's, he's surprised that Joe is, is interested in being there or welcoming him and being there, and it's, I think, a nice reminder to the audience that Joe's actually not there on stage at the moment. So during that revelation between Chris and um, George, Joe has not heard that. So again, reinforcing the dramatic irony that's been created through this exchange. And again, we've got this another, another sort of slightly humorous interjection here between um, mother and Chris. Um, and she, they refer to, she says, um, her father, the retired police inspector, Sergeant George, he's a very kind man. He looks like a gorilla. Um, he never shot anyone. They all burst out laughing. So there's a sort of you know, um, humorous exchange here, which is then completely interrupted by the arrival of Joe, who comes downstairs at this point. So it's, you know, uh, the, the sudden stopping of that laughing, you can imagine, and George rising abruptly and staring at Joe, as it says here, um, you know, this is what he's come to do. He's come to confront him. But I think to shift it between humor and tension between the characters really helps to keep it dramatically exciting for the audience. So the last section of the play that you're reading here will take you about 15 minutes, so it'll take you a bit longer to read. And this is obviously the confrontation between George and Joe. So it, this is from um, this page 22 on the document right down to the end um, of this PDF. Um, so you're reading the rest of Act 2 before we go through it together. So read the rest of Act 2, um, and then when you've read that, unpause the video and we'll go through that together. So this is obviously the um, exciting moment of confrontation in the play where 
Joe is confronted by George's accusations and eventually at the end of this scene confesses um, that it was him and not Steve um, who is responsible for shipping out the crack cylinder heads on the on the plane. So um, the, this section begins with George's observations that as he passed Joe's factory, it looked like General Motors, which obviously is a huge industry in America. And he's commenting there that Joe's business is clearly doing very well. So again, um, creating that, um, that expectation that Joe has been um, thriving while his father has been rotting away in prison, basically. Um, and George says, um, that he's unwell because it's his soul that's suffering. It's not um, his his physical health, it's his mental health that's suffering here. And what's interesting, I think, is that Keller again uses that language to describe the crime that was committed as a mistake. And remember, that was important in Act One, and it's, it's extra important, extra important, it's significantly important here because obviously it's Joe that actually committed this crime. Um, and so he is thinking about himself as having commit, having made a mistake rather than committing murder. And he wants to make the distinction between the two very clear here. If you move down towards the end of this page, it says um, that he, re he asserts that the man, Steve, never learned how to take the blame. And obviously there's a significant irony to that because Joe is the one that's to blame and who has not taken the blame for the crimes that were committed here. Um, so I'm gonna skip past the next page and on to page 25 here or page 65 in your document. And significantly, mother says, Joe has not been laid up in 15 years. He never gets sick. And remember earlier in this scene, the reason that Joe was not able to go down to the factory to check the crack cylinder heads was because he said he had the flu. And very quickly, Joe comes back with, except my flu during the war. And mother's questions there, huh? You know, her, she's forgotten really that this was part of the lie. Um, and she says, well, sure. And to George, I meant except for that. You know, there's a real sense of her covering up here um, and that she does perhaps know the truth as we mentioned earlier. Um, and then George really jumps on this idea about him never being sick and tries to probe that further, but is interrupted by the arrival of Frank, which happens quite a lot in this play. Um, you know, Frank arrives here and what he's got is Larry's horoscope um, and it disrupts the conversation and it disrupts the revelation of the truth for the audience as well, draws out the drama um, for them. And remember this horoscope that he's making is significant because again, it's reinforcing Kate's delusions that Larry's still alive. She can't make a horoscope for someone who's dead here. And what he says as well is Frank um, says, somewhere in the world, your brother is alive. And that November the 25th was his favorable day, he says down here. So he's really um, encouraging Kate to hold on to her belief that Larry is actually still alive. Um, and what happens here is George is still um, fixated on this idea about um, Joe having never been sick. He keeps coming back to that um, and, and wanting an answer to this question. He's not sort of distracted by this exchange about the horoscopes here. Um, and if you keep going down on this page towards the end of page 27, Mother reasserts what was said at the very beginning of Act One when they talked about Anne's arrival, that Chris cannot marry Anne because she is she's Larry's girl, as it says here. And that if, remember, if Chris and Anne marry, then logically that must mean that Larry, do I say Chris and Larry? Sorry, Chris and Anne marry. It would mean that Larry is dead. He must be dead. So I'm his brother and he's dead and I'm marrying his girl. And there's, you know, mother never, never in this world. There's a real sense of, um, you know, her refusal to accept that Larry is dead here, absolutely adamant here. And it's interesting that Joe says here, I've got plenty to say here. Three and a half years you've been making, talking like a maniac. This cruelty of Joe at this moment is quite interesting because he's not really cruel in the rest of the play. He's trying to make Kate face the truth at this point, but is that cruelty coming out of a place of anxiety maybe in here? And what you get in the rest of this page is this desperation of Kate where it says, mother rolling out of her till he comes forever and, and until he comes and the exclamations in her language here um, as she is absolutely adamant as she says your brother your brother's alive darling because if he's dead your father killed him do you understand me now as long as you live that boy is alive god does not let a son be killed by his father and that's so important here in this play because kate is connecting larry's death 
with all the pilots. And remember the title of the play, that idea of all my sons, all these pilots that lost their life by Joe's factory sending out the cracked cylinder heads here. Um, and her refusal to admit or accept that Larry is dead is completely tied up in her delusion that Joe did not commit the crime that, that he did and that he wasn't responsible for it. And then Keller, again, is re, re, he's refusing to acknowledge that connection here. He says, Larry never flew a P-40. But what you see then from Chris's reaction is that Chris is starting to put together what George said earlier and is starting to realize that actually George was telling the truth and that Joe is guilty here. And so Mother connects Larry's death with the death of the pilots, and Keller doesn't. He doesn't see a connection. He doesn't see that one equals the other here um, in this exchange. It's important. Remember that, again, he doesn't see it as murder. It's a mistake to him, that the error that was made here. Um, but Chris is, is, is acknowledging this or starting to realize that George is telling the truth when he says, Dad, you killed 21 men. And Keller saying, I, I didn't kill anybody. He doesn't see it as um, a crime of murder or, or he, that he is responsible for the death of these pilots. And it's interesting that it's Chris that, pro that probes this further with, jo with um, Joe at this point in the play, not George. Because remember that idea that Joe has done everything for his son and that it, he is all about providing for his family. So it's more painful for Joe really to be confronted by Chris than it is to being confronted by George at this point. And he says here, I'm in business. A man is in business, 120 cracked and you're out of business. You get a process. So the process doesn't work. You're out of business. So he's saying if he didn't ship off those cylinder heads, he would have been out of business here. And he said, I, I never thought they'd install them. I swear to God, I thought they'd just stop them before anybody took off. So again, this real attempt on Joe's part to justify what he sees as a mistake here, a business error here. And he says he never expected them to install the cracked cylinder heads. And then he says that, but the weeks passed and he didn't find, didn't hear anything. And so he thought he was going to tell them, he was going to let them know that these cylinder heads were faulty and would cause a problem, um, but he didn't. And, and that's important as well because Chris realizes, as it says down here, you knew they wouldn't hold up in the air. You knew they'd crash because otherwise he'd have no need to tell them here. And what's important about Joe and his motivation here is that he says, Chris, I did it for you. You know, it's not a sense of him trying. He, he wants the business to succeed so that he can provide for his family. Um, what's important to Joe is, is his community, his immediate community, his immediate family. Um, and um, Chris really has quite a conflicting view and opinion to Joe here. Um, as he says down here at the end, um, he says here, um, don't you have a country? Don't you live in the world? You know, he can't believe that Joe doesn't have some sort of um, sense of conscience about the effect that this would have had um, on, on the other soldiers here. It's not about individual men here saying that it's about his loyalty to the country here. He didn't you know, don't you think about the world beyond your immediate family? Um, he says um, here that he, and importantly, remember we said earlier in Act One that it's important that Chris had also served in the army here. And he says, I was dying every day and you were killing my boys um, here. So he says, you know, so Chris, again, like Kate, sees the soldiers who died in war as, as, as his soldiers. He doesn't, it's not, he's seeing a sense of responsibility for those men. And he says here, kids were hanging in the air by those heads. You knew that. So those cylinder heads, that, that they were keeping people up in the air here. Um, and again, Keller saying, for you, a business for you, that's what he wanted to provide. That's what is important to Joe, is providing that business and that security to his um, family. And there's this conflict, as it says here, between Christie's responsibility to the wider world and Joe's responsibility he sees as very much for his family. Um, so this confrontation is what ends, or admission is what ends Act Two, and it's significant that the last lines of Act Two are Keller's, Joe Keller's words, "Chris, my Chris." You know, the the ultimate um, punishment for Joe really is to be rejected by his son here, um, and for his son to um, to break their relationship and to not want to take on the business and to see Joe in the way that Chris does at the end of Act One and. You see that sort of um, destruction of Joe um, at the end of this final scene as he's confronted by Chris, as Chris discovers the reality of Joe's crimes.